So my job here today from North Texas, from Dallas-Fort Worth, from the North Texas HQ, the Salem Radio Network and Salem News Channel, where I'm the happy morning host of uh, the 660 AM The Answer team here in DFW. My job is to spend some time today with you, with some guests, with some audio, some clips, and sort of put our thumb on the pulse of where we are this morning. We are a, a, a couple, I, Wednesday morning, two weeks ago, I, I don't know about you, but I kind of still can't believe that it happened. And as I lay out some things with you and for you and in, uh, in partnership with you, you know the phone number here in, uh, in, in Hugh Hewitt land, 1-800-520-1234, 1-800-520-1234. We're going to be welcoming uh, Matt Cottonetti. Uh, coming up a little bit later on this hour, and the great Mary Catherine Ham, fresh off a boffo engagement on Real Time with Bill Maher. I want to ask her about that. She'll be at the end of this hour. So between now, front half, we're a little bit wide open. I want to say hi to Dwayne. We can say hi to you at 1-800-520-1234. Once we get to the beginning of the next hour, though, I'm going to do a bit of a deep dive with all y'all uh, about all the Trump picks, about where we think they're all going, and obviously the vast majority of them are going to sail right through, and they absolutely deserve to. Even Pete Hegseth, I believe, is not going to be problematic. These are, the Trump picks are, they're very Trumpian, which one could certainly expect them to be, meaning that in many cases they drip with the kind of authoritarian, authoritarian, they drip authoritative, <laughs> Freudian slip, they drip with the kind of authoritative, uh, competence and the, the, just the, the kind of, you know, Barack Obama talked a good game about hope and change. We got hope, we got change. We got to have hope and we're going to change. The, and, and I would always ask people, change from what to what? Ch what? What kind of change are you even looking for? I would ask the Obama voter and they could rarely really articulate that. Uh, we can, I can. We're looking at change from corruption to accountability. Change from the, the, the left having a stranglehold on so many things to a, a, a populist tinged conservatism running the show for a little while with delicious, delicious one party rule, at least for two years. And that, that's what I called for. I said, listen, I, I, you know, I called for it. I mean, it's what I talked about on the show. I said, listen, uh, we, we've had a, a Democrat president, a Democrat Senate, a slim majority in the House. Give us all three legs of the stool. Give us the White House. Give us the Senate. Give us the House. We've been given those things now. And if and if we mess up, you can start firing us. The, the, when the midterms start next week. I mean, people start running uh, for 2026, uh, you know, lunchtime today. So uh, the, the next election is never really far away. But we've got such a deep hole to dig ourselves out of and so many things that need doing. And some of them are distinctly political part of my joy at this result that we got to celebrate two weeks ago um and i just i'll never forget waking up because if i get up uh, for something to do my own show that starts at seven and i start listening to hugh as all good americans should and his joy his satisfaction it, it was it's not just a it it, it it isn't just a satisfaction um based on Yay for our side, yay Republicans, yay conservatives. Oh, that's part of it to be sure. But some of it is just, is because I'm an American, because I'm a human being. I want people in power who, who think that our country needs a border. I want people in power who know how many genders there are. And that sets us up for a transgender member of Congress and we got a bathroom issue on Capitol Hill. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. Oh, because you know, Mike Johnson doesn't want to, we will. And I understand his reticence, but this has got to go one way or the other. And I got some thoughts on which way it ought to go. You got some thoughts on all kinds of things, I'm sure. 1-800-520-1234. Early burst of calls, ready to do it if you are. 1-800-520-1234. The headline of this morning is that J.D. Vance, uh, best running mate ever. He just was. I mean, I put this to the test. I went looking at all the running mates. I mean, I loved Jack Kemp running with Bob Dole. Please, how do you not love that? But the way this worked out and the, the way he just fit into the, the puzzle just so beautifully, the magnificent J.D. Vance is going to hit Capitol Hill for some meetings uh, between key GOP senators and shall we say, uh, well, certainly Matt Gates. It's going to be Matt Gates, Pete Hegseth, 
J.D. Vance, some key GOP senators, oh, to be a fly on the wall. So uh, your thoughts are welcome, 1-800-520-1234. Let me welcome the Monday and Friday host this week. Again, Ed Morrissey is tomorrow. Kurt Schlichter was yesterday. Always a joy. Uh, producer Dwayne Patterson in the house. Dwayne, good morning. How you doing, man? Great, Mark. How are you? I am absolutely fantastic. It is always great to be with you guys. You did a great job Monday, and I know you'll wrap up the week on Friday. Uh, I was looking at some stories from 2016. Right. And, and this is November 20th. And the ca the cabinet's about done. I mean, they're, they're, most of the big names are done. In 2016, Trump didn't have his first name out, the first nomination, until November 18th right, what of was, 2016. Right, because what was going on then? Uh, we had this whole Trump-Russia thing going on, right? We had all this, all this, all this background stuff about uh, election interference. And from, I mean, from the day after his election in 2016, his, his uh, campaign, his transition team was besieged by the Washington elite class, right? When those things happened, exactly right. It was incredibly distracting. Those, not only are those distractions not there anymore, are, 2016 and during, what, during his campaign in 2020, th there was abject, not fear, but concern, reticence, hesitance, to to be pro Trump, it it could it, it exacted a toll on you uh, at work, uh, it, on the streets of Manhattan or wherever you may live, especially in a blue city. I, it's not like that's gone, but there's no, something. It, there's it's, something. It, yeah, it's it, different. It, it's what, it's suppressed. It is totally different. How what, do you see what that? Trump has done? And I've been making this case for about the last week or so. He has made being a Republican cool again. Whether it's the Trump dance at all the sports venues. He has made it okay to be a Republican. It's okay to be a conservative again. To a lot of young people, to Gen Z, it's okay to be conservative. In fact, it's kind of counterculture now to be a conservative. So Trump has kind of put the cool back in Republicans. I, and on the Trump dance, which NFL players are doing, college players are doing, soccer players are doing. Uh, Brett Favre was on Laura Ingram the night before last or something. She asked him, is the NFL going to outlaw going to outlaw the Trump dance. They tell people they can't do that. The NFL has officially weighed in and said they are not going to outlaw the Trump dance. And the NFL has been the no fun league for a long time. Good for them for holding that stance. Uh, so um, as, as we, with Senate confirmations coming up, right. and, and I'm going to get deep into Gates at the beginning of the next hour, but a lot of people are saying that with a pick that some folks said, look, you could have gone with Ken Paxton. You could have gone with Mike Lee of Utah. You could have gone with Jonathan Turley and gotten the same kind of buzzsaw without all the, the sideshow. Some people are thinking maybe there's a reason for the sideshow, that maybe Trump is trying to smoke out uncooperative Republican senators. Maybe he's that there, there's some unseen game there. Do you think that's overthinking? I think it's overthinking. I mean, it's possible that it, you put up a blocker that, that can be the— the designated scalp to give so that uh, all the other semi-controversial picks get through without as much attention on them. I guess that, that theory is out there and possible. I, I would say probably not because if you were going to do that, you would have at least picked up the phone and called people Precisely. like Chuck Grassley and <laughs> warned him think. it was coming. One would think. So they say the camera adds 10 pounds, and there you are on camera. Listen, camera may add 10 pounds, but PhD weight loss will help you peel off 50. How'd you do it? Uh, the old fashioned way, no shots, no drugs, uh, none of that kind of stuff. Just basically a protein diet, talking to a counselor and figuring out what my schedule was like and creating a meal plan that helped me do it and held me accountable when I didn't do what I was supposed to do in a given week. And then the biggest thing is once you lose it, help keep it off, learn how to, how to uh, account for what happens to you on a day to day life, uh, experience so that you don't pack on the pounds again. And there are lots of ways to lose weight, but keeping it off is the key. And tell them you heard about it on the Hugh Hewitt Show uh, at PhDWeightLoss.com. Or obviously, you can call 864-644-1900. That's 864-644-1900. A pleasure to do that phone number dance with Dwayne. 
and he's going to handle today's show and the calls are going to come in and the clips are going to fly and we're going to talk about a wide number of things. Mark Davis in for Hugh. So uh, what I've been doing on the local show each morning is waking up and telling everybody, hey, here's the latest addition to the Trump cabinet because there's usually two or three or four and we've worked our way through uh, the, the big ones and the not so big ones, but all of them are important. And the ones that I'm particularly intrigued about are the cabinet posts that probably shouldn't exist. Uh, they are the departments that I just don't think we need anymore, and that is uh, education, commerce, and energy. Uh, my own former governor, Rick Perry, stood on a, you may remember this, it's the Rick Perry oops moment. Uh, he stood on a debate stage in 2012 and said, you know, there are three departments that we really don't need in government, uh, commerce, uh, education, and, um, and, um, and, uh, and like other rivals started to try to help him out with what the other one might be. Well, it wound up, and he just went, oops, little brain fart, we all have them. And of course, the, one, the, the third one that he couldn't remember was uh, the Department of Energy, which ironically, he wound up being secretary of in the Trump administration. You can't make this stuff up. The reason these things, this is not to disparage the concept of energy and education and commerce, those are important things, but do we need a big honking government department with thousands of employees overseeing all of those things? Commerce, what even really do they do? Energy? Uh, government has a role in energy policy, but does it need an entire uh, an entire cabinet post? And then we get to education. And there's part of our news uh, overnight is that Linda McMahon, uh, wife of Vince, WWE fame, but she's had quite the think tank and education uh, activist. And she, she was a small business administration in Trump 1.0. So her resume is absolutely fine. And the thing that I love uh, about her, which is a lot, but what Trump has said about her is that she's, she is being named Secretary of Education maybe to actually sunset that whole agency. She may be the steward of its demise as education is returned to where it absolutely uh, should be, and that is with the states. Because way too long, the problem with, with the federal government having some kind of say over, uh, over education is it takes decisions out of your school board, out of your state capital, puts them in Washington where there's just no reason for it to be. Want to see someplace else that's been deleterious to education policy? Get a load of Randy Weingarten. This is on News Nation with Leland Vittert, and she shares with us what she thinks kind of the problem with education is of late. So, you know, let's actually talk about what teachers do. First off, let me just say, I think we all should be responsible for our kids. And frankly, the things that we are suggesting to do are things that make, that help kids graduate on time and graduate with careers. So if we were listened to a lot more, I think that we'd see the kind of results that you just talked about and that we see in other places in the world. So let's so, Ms. Weingarten says, if only we would listen to the teachers' unions more. Well, I remember, well, I did listen to, uh, I listened to the teachers' unions all the time. I listened to everybody all the time. The father of modern psychology, William James, once said, there is great wisdom in knowing what to ignore. And listen, is there a role in life for teachers' unions? Sure, why not? It's a free country <laughs> for the moment. At least it will be again. They have free speech. Uh, but boy, during COVID, during the lockdowns, during the shutdowns, what was done to our children from, from, from a, a teacher's union mentality, teacher's unions and junk science, we will be, it, it, it will take perhaps a generation uh, to dig ourselves out of what was done to our kids through, um, I, I think in some cases, willful malfeasance, because there are some people for whom policy victories really are more important than the fate of our children, for whom political gains and power really are more important than what and whether our kids learn. It's a great day any day of the week to sit in for you, but when you sit in on Wednesday, you get to say hi to Matt Continetti, doing great work over there at American Enterprise and on the commentary mag. Matthew, welcome, sir. How you doing? I'm doing well, Mark. Thanks for having me. 
It is very nice to have you. I want to talk about your upcoming or, or the already released piece in commentary about the new Republican majority. It's a very 30,000-foot look at sort of how Trump did it. I want to get to that in a second. But first, hot, fresh headlines. What's your thought on all these incoming nominees, how you think they're going to go collectively, individually? How's Trump 2.0 working out for you a couple of weeks in? Well, I think Trump 2.0 is a very exciting time in American politics. You know, the first thing that strikes me when I look at these tr uh, picks for cabinet posts and White House posts is the speed at which Trump is making these decisions. Some of the fastest transition appointments uh, in the history of the presidency. And the second thing I'm looking at is uh, the difference between two groups of Trump nominees. Uh, for many of the Trump picks, um, they are uh, people who are kind of fitted into these posts um, pretty conventionally. You know, think Marco Rubio at the State Department, Elise Stefanik mm -hmm. at the UN. Um, even someone like former Congressman Sean Duffy at Transportation. You know, he's someone who has a long experience in politics. He's also a media figure. Then there's the unconventional picks. And what I think is interesting mm -hmm. about them, folks like Matt Gates at DOJ or RFK Jr. at HHS, even Tulsi Gabbard at DNI, is that they all kind of share a um, skepticism toward the institution that Trump is appointing them to lead. And what that says to me mm -hmm. is that Trump wants to do it his way this time. He had some trouble with some of the agencies in his first administration, in particular the security agencies, DOJ, FBI, DOD. And this time he wants to put in people that he trusts, people who have also had uh, adverse experiences with those agencies, and he wants to exert mm -hmm. his control over them. So if they make it through confirmation, I think it will be a very different Trump administration the second time around, one where the president is much more in charge of his cabinet. Yeah, because Trump has always been kind of a take charge kind of guy, wanting things his way. That's that's you know central to his DNA. And yet in Trump 1.0, it just didn't seem to work out that way because I don't think he knew exactly how the field was striped. Everybody glibly says government ought to run like a business. Government is not a business. It's a million miles from being a business, and it's very very different. And I think he knows the ways in which it is different. Let me you mentioned I think exactly the the unconventional nominees. I think. Every Everybody kind of knows what folks' problems are with Matt Gates. You can accept or dismiss them. I think they kind of know what the, the pushback is against RFK Jr. You know, we can talk about that. But Tulsi Gabbard is one that intrigues me. First of all, her conversion has been fascinating. There was a stretch there where she was on Fox News at least as much as Hannity. I mean, the woman is clearly a Republican now. What do you think is the, is the, the source of some people? I, I've Two types I've heard of. People have looked back at things she was voting for when she was a member of Congress and stuff she was saying 10 years ago. She's clearly changed. Also, there's that pesky meeting with Assad in Syria. That seems to be a stain for some. What's fair, what's unfair in all of that? Well, Gabbard is a very interesting political figure. I mean, the, the first thing to say about her is that she is a critic of American foreign policy, and she's someone who has been critical of the foreign policies of bipartisan presidential administrations from the standpoint of non-intervention, foreign policy restraint, um, someone who believes that American foreign policy has been aggressive uh, and has often taken the side of figures like Assad or even Vladimir Putin uh, to bring their perspective into the debate. At the same time, she's someone who's has experience in national security, I mean, serving in the, in the National Guard and uh, as a veteran. And she also is a critic of certain trends within uh, the military and the culture in political correctness, for example, uh, the rise of wokeism. Um, what I think uh, Trump is looking for with Tulsi Gabbard is someone who's going to provide a dissident view, a kind of alternative view to the foreign policy mainstream. And having that person at the, as the director of national intelligence, I think, is also interesting because that job, it's not really a managerial job. It's more of a job of kind of organization, collating the different reports of all of the different intelligence agencies, and then presenting the consensus to the president. I think what Trump is looking for with Gabbard is someone who's not going to take the consensus at face value, someone who's going to push back. And that's, I think helpful when Trump is making decisions because he's going to look for that unconventional viewpoint anyway. This way, Tulsi Gabbard will be a close and trusted advisor, 
but she's also going to have to face, I think, the counter arguments from very established and uh, highly credentialed foreign policy types like Marco Rubio, like uh, Mike Waltz at NSC, uh, like Elise Stefanik, and like Pete Hegseth at DOD, who, you know, he's an unconventional choice on his own, but he's someone whose foreign policy is much more in line, I think, with traditional Republican foreign policy than, say, Tulsi Gabbard is. Do you believe that whether it's Tulsi Gabbard and some national security view that she may hold or RFK Jr. being pretty radically pro-abortion or something else, the, the, the thing that I keep coming back to is every single one of these people now knows they're not some rogue free spirit. They are in a Trump administration and every single view of theirs is going to be funneled through the world of Trump. And I just don't think I see a lot of conflict coming to you. Well, I, I think you're I think you're on to something there, Mark. I mean, I do believe that RFK Jr.'s views on abortion will come up in a uh, Senate confirmation. I mean, remember, the Senate is controlled by Republicans. And even though Donald Trump has really changed the Republican Party's view on abortion, saying that it's a policy that should really be left to the states, there are many Republican senators who are passionately pro-life. And so I think they will ask RFK Jr. about it. And I believe that RFK Jr.'s answer will be very similar to what you just said, Mark, which is that, look, I've worked for President Trump. And I've always thought that people sometimes can go a little lean ahead of their skis and thinking that they are the policymakers or that they are somehow more important than President Trump is. And when that happens, it usually doesn't end well for the person who has <laughs> kind of a big head. So I, I do think with, the, with this picks, you know, these are people that Trump knows. They're people that Trump likes. They're all good communicators. They're all good on television. And they all share to varying degrees Trump's worldview. And so I think you'll, you'll have less freelancing in the second Trump administration, more of a sense that everyone is working to advance Donald Trump's agenda, not their own private agendas. Uh, the latest uh, commentary mag piece from Matthew Cottonetti in the December 24 uh, edition is called The New Republican Majority. You identify what happened, what didn't happen, why it happened. Uh, what do you think are the takeaways, the lessons of this remarkable uh, campaign cycle? What's, what's the big lesson of all of this? Absolutely. Well, I think the first big lesson is that Americans are extremely dissatisfied with the state of their nation. Um, that when you look at the surveys that were conducted on election night, the surveys surrounding the election, you see that Americans are very dissatisfied with the direction that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris put the country on. And a corollary of that is that Americans desire change. For people who wanted change, and that was a majority of the electorate, they overwhelmingly voted for Donald Trump. And so with all of these controversial picks, I often say to people, look, Americans know what they're getting. Trump was president before. People understand his uh, views on things. They were watching the rallies even while much of the mainstream media was caught up with the vibes and the joy of Kamala Harris's losing <laughs> campaign. So they are voting for change. I think that's the first takeaway. And the second one, Mark, is they want this economy to return to the way it was under Trump right before the pandemic hit in 2020. They want stable prices. They want growing incomes, especially among working class Americans and minority Americans. Uh, and they want jobs, right? They want a sense that uh, the American president is fighting for American jobs and not necessarily in, more interested in upholding this global economic and military structure that America has led now for some 80 years. So I think the economy is important. I also believe that this was a vote to close the southern border. You know, when you look at the priorities of uh, Americans, immigration ranked very highly. I think there's no question that what Joe Biden did to the southern border had catastrophic consequences, not only for his presidency, but for many communities throughout this, this nation. And so when I look at Donald Trump's priorities in the coming years, he has an opportunity now to fix the two big problems. One is the economy and two is the border. If he does that, he'll be on track to have a very successful second term, or as I like to call it, his second first term.
That's <laughs> exactly right. About 60 seconds for this, and we could do an entire segment on it. Let's talk around the world. He, he made a, a big point of saying, look, I'm not, I'm not going to have Nikki Haley. I'm not going to have Mike Pompeo, who's awesome. But Mike Pompeo is a big believer in a lot more money for Ukraine. Tulsi Gabbard decidedly is not. Is this foreign policy team a big message to Zelensky that the trough of money is about to come to an end? Uh, I do believe so. When you look at these foreign policy picks, including Waltz, including Stefanik, including Rubio, they all were very much skeptical or opposed to additional money for Ukraine this year. And so what that means is Trump wants to enter this end game in Ukraine with a free hand, with the maximum amount of maneuverability in order to say to both parties, not just Ukraine, but also Russia, that if we want this awful war to end, he will be willing to take steps to either disadvantage or advantage either party so we can restore something like the balance of power. So this is, uh, this is I think we're entering the end game of the Ukraine war. I don't know very how good. it's going to turn out. It's very dangerous. Uh, no, I don't know, nor do I. It, it, yeah, right. That, Matt, thank you. I love hearing you on Wednesday. I love hosting on Wednesday so that we can talk. Matt Cottonetti at Commentary. All right, it is an opportunity. As I've said to Matt Cottonetti, I love listening to the Hugh Hewitt Show every day, especially Wednesday because of the cool guests. When I fill in on Wednesday, oh gosh, I get to talk to these people. And that means Mary Catherine Ham is here. MK, welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Fresh off a just stellar engagement on Real Time with Bill Maher. You did a super job. There's a moment I want to run by you, and then we're going to talk a little bit about elections because you've been looking at how ridiculously long it's taking for things to happen and the absurdities of Pennsylvania. Bill Maher is on the Mount Rushmore of fairly reasonable people who still consider themselves Democrats. He was so contorted about this. He didn't concede. This is a danger to democracy. I wanted to rise up on behalf of tens of millions of voters and say, of course he still feels like he got screwed in 2020. He probably did to some degree. The good news is with his return, that all blissfully seems not to matter. How did that all strike you there in the studio? Yeah, I mean, the thing that bothers me is that part of, as I told him, part of democracy is listening to voters. Right. And Dem Democrats put to voters whether January 6th was the end of the world, whether it was 9-11, whether it was the only thing that matters. And voters said, no, it's not the only thing that matters. The problem is they put it up against voters regular lives and voters notice that Democrats actually engage in election denialism as they're doing in Pennsylvania right now, where Bob Casey, I think, has yet to concede. And as Bill Maher noted, he said, hey, if, if Trump had not won, we'd be in Pennsylvania looking for phantom votes that were going to show up at some point. And I said, funny, you should say that, because let me <laughs> tell you about what they're doing in Pennsylvania right now. Um, and that's what, that's what he said. Nobody cares about Bob Casey. He said, everybody cares about Bob Casey. Everybody cares yeah. about about the McCormick Senate seat. It, it's crazy that it took this long. Uh, it's crazy that it took Josh Shapiro, another supposedly reasonable Democrat, that long to, to cry foul. And there are still votes two weeks. There's, we're still counting votes in California. How does this happen? It's so disgraceful. I, it, so the thing that should motivate California to do better next time is that Trump got an incredible narrative for two weeks about his substantial win, which remains substantial. But if they had counted their votes quickly, it would not have been the same story for the last two weeks. But they created that because they decided they were going to take two weeks to count votes. And I just I don't know how anyone there can have confidence in what they're doing. Make America Florida again. I mean, we got to just get everybody counting votes on night one. It's ridiculous. All right, couple of minutes. Let's do something we could do a couple of hours on. I've already talked about Matt Gates. I've talked about the cabinet. I've done this. I've done that. You are a conservative. You are a woman. You, however, have a heart and want people treated with dignity. Me too on all the above. We have a trans congressperson, Sarah McBride. And now I, I think we make, make Sarah... A one holer, a restroom that 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 he she can use. It, it, here we are. What, what what's the best way out of this? Because th there are two bad answers. One is to say let this person into the women's room. I don't think that's a good message for women. And the so I don't know. What's what's your solution? Yeah, I think well, part of it it solves itself because I think a lot of these offices have their own bathrooms, so this person can use the one in her office. Uh, the other issue I think is. 
and this is something that people spoke about in the election. Like they're they're done with being pushed around on these issues and told that they're bad people if they have concerns about it. So I think women are allowed to say, "Hey, I have limits on this. I don't want to be in a bathroom where I don't know who's going to be in there." Right. So there needs to be a unisex one that's clearly marked, or we need to do this differently. But you do need to listen to women. Remember, believe all women. Uh, you need to listen to women on these kinds of issues, particularly when it comes to like a dressing room situation. Um, a bathroom is a little more cash, but a dressing room or something along those lines, or a locker room for minors, these are things that people are actually upset about, and Democrats insisted on bullying them for a long time about them. And now it's going to be out in the open, and it's going to be a pretty serious fight in some places. That it is. Well, listen, just pleasure to see you on with Bill Maher. Pleasure to have you here. Great to talk to you when I'm in here, Mary Catherine. Thank you so much. For, and everybody, watch the Getting Hammered podcast. You and Vic do a great job. Thank you, MK. Appreciate you. Thanks, Mark. All right. So let's so let's do this. Let's set up, because we've had our little bevy of guests there, but as we work our way into the next hour, I have some things to bounce off you, and maybe the transgender congressperson is one of them, if you want to address that, at 1-800-520-1234, one 520 one two three four, and as I mentioned at the top of the of the show, let's. I think there are three ways to feel about Matt Gates. One is no problem. Trump wants him. He's awesome, and the House report doesn't matter. The other side of that is this is a horrible pick, and, and I hate that Trump made it. The middle ground is it wouldn't have been my favorite pick, but Trump's president, so let's let it go. Which of those? Is you. It's a pretty intense gig, and, and, and Hugh has been one of the hardest working people in Joe business over the last few weeks and months, as, as we all have been shouldering the load of this election and just having in conservative media anyway the, the most massive, d delicious, magnificent exhale uh, on the election results that we got to celebrate two weeks ago today. Still can't believe it happened. Pinch me, is it real? Yes, it is. And it used to be, I mean, Hugh's done this for a while, I've done this for a while. And there was a time when, right after an election, things really slowed down. Uh, I think Hugh and I both voted for the first time in the election of 1976. We tried to prevent the, uh, uh, the Jimmy Carter presidency, but we just didn't have enough company. Uh, after, after that, and then two Reagan wins, and a Bush 41 win, and all that, and then, you know, then Clinton, don't get me started, uh, as life will provide. There will be elections that you win and elections that you don't. If you do this for a living, back in the day, way back in the day, uh, time was that after an election, between the election and the inauguration, I mean, it was it was like crickets and tumbleweeds in a way. I mean, sure, you had a transition, but people took their time on that. Everybody just kind of wanted to distance and decompress. Ha <laughs> ha, how silly that seems now. <laughs> how, how nostalgic we are. It's good for business in, uh, in, in, in all media, to be sure. It might be good for business in liberal media. Is there, uh, let me give you the phone number because I got a couple of things I'm just going to blurt out. We're going to go to the Gates nomination and the Tulsi Gabbard nomination and the RFK Jr. and the uh, and the Pete Hegseth and all these. Just just pick one, pick two. Let's, let's chat about it. 1-800-520-1234. That's the Hugh Hewitt Show phone number. 1-800-520-1234. Follow me on the old X Twitter, uh, at Mark Davis, M-A-R-K Davis. I'll take a look at those during the commercial breaks. We'll bandy things back back and forth there if you like. But the best place is here on the phone at 1-800-520-1234. Um, as we take a look at, at what played out for everybody on uh, election night and the following morning, what enabled us to wake up to this glorious result, it, the, 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 one of the first things that people wanted to know, that I wanted to know, is how would the haters react. How would the people who have spent a long time telling us that he is Hitler, that he's a fascist, that he is injurious to democracy itself, once he won, if he won, and now that he has won, what would those people do? Uh, true to form, some of them, I guess, continue to believe that he's Hitler. In fact, when we talk about media bias, and I've been talking about media bias for a really long time, my career, I mean, I've been doing talk shows since 1982. And 
that was when, I, at like the age of 25, I started to notice, hey, reporters don't like Reagan. What's up with that? I mean, they're entitled to like or not like whomever they, li they wish, but it seems to be creeping its way into their news stories. What's that about? Well, that, of course, was advocacy journalism at its, not its birth. I mean, Walter Cronkite was not as down the middle as everybody believes. But, um, but that's when it really grew noxious. Um, and then you get to the Clinton era, and, and you had your, your Dan Rathers and your Peter Jenningses and your Bryant Gumbles just so clearly in the tank for Clinton and other Democrats. And by then, I'd been doing talk shows for a decade or more. It's like it's baked in. This is what they do. Bias is terrible. Bias is dishonest. Bias is corrupt. But in this election season, what we've been through this time, when with this shallow society that we have now, so many 22-year-olds with their faces just buried in TikTok and never getting out of their own bubble. If we have a culture, and I don't even just mean MSNBC, about which I'll dwell here in a moment, uh, but, but so many sources of opinion, and, and we have, we're, we're not growing young people the way we used to. You know, not that everybody needs to be like me, but, but we, I read a paper every once in a while. I consumed things that I didn't agree with in order to assess my own views and understand how other people thought. That's gone the way of the dinosaur. We have countless young people, maybe your sons and daughters, who believe that if you voted for Trump, you are okay with Hitler. And that's tough around Thanksgiving, you could say. I've noticed that there's some healing, and I'm very pleased about that. But after the election on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of election week, I was just awash in stories of people who said, uh, my, my kids have disowned me, or, 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 or the, the, the friends and family relationships have been just completely crushed against the curb because of because they think that that I am a fascist they think that I'm okay with Hitler and the reason these people believe that number 1 they're idiots but number 2 there is an entire culture that said this for over a year and that that brings us to Joe and Mika morning joe m o u r n i n g as the the spelling might go lately um they it's a weird track for them they, in 2015 and 16, had Trump on all the time. They were having a great time. Maybe they didn't think he would win. Maybe they didn't think they'd be accessories to his 2016 victory. I don't know. But after he won, and then, of course, after he ran for re-election in 2020, they savaged him for years. They were part of the contingent that said that he's Hitler, part of the contingent that said that he's a fascist, part of the contingent that said that he is... Uh, a threat to democracy itself. And now they're fresh back from having visited him at Mar-a-Lago. Isn't that lovely? I actually do like that. I think it's better than the alternative. Megyn Kelly had uh, some choice words uh, on her broadcast. She said, I've been thinking about ethics and my entire journalism career gives me a two-word answer. And it was basically for them to go blank themselves. Okay, I get that. I don't trust Joe and Mika as far as I can throw them. I believe that it was a self-preservation move. I believe it's phony. I think they still hate his guts. But if they're going to, but I can't read minds. And if they're going to do the right thing, if you really want to call it that, and open lines of communication, isn't that better than just continuing to call him Hitler on Morning Joe every morning during his actual presidency? So yes, it's phony, and yes, it's self-preservation, and they're trying to stop the bleeding of the already sparse MSNBC viewing audience, but I'm prepared not to care. You know, I also think that once Trump starts doing things, they, in the liberal media culture, will start to savage him all over again, and you know what? That'll be okay, because they'll be disagreeing with stuff he does. That's what liberals are supposed to do, disagree with things we say and things we do as conservatives. That's what debate is about. That's what engaging in the media culture is about. Um, but wow, what we've been through, with, with, with it's never been worse. Media corruption and lies and distortions have never been worse. I'd like to think, 
as we get ready to take some of your calls about, I've sort of run long on this, I definitely want to ask you about the, the, the nominations and the Gates and the Gabbards and the RFK juniors, 1-800-520-1234, 1-800-520-1234. But I think this gets better. This is one of the long list of things that simply gets better. Caroline Levitt is going to be the White House press secretary. Boy, that's an upgrade at that position. She, I, I, was sometime, I sometimes felt sorry for Corrine Jean-Pierre. I, I, I mean, not much, because she willfully looked into that binder and spread its lies across the land. Um, but any press secretary, they're not just up there riffing out of their own head and their own heart. They are the mouthpiece, the literal mouthpiece, of whatever administration they serve. Caroline Levitt will be <laughs> unburdened by what has come before. <laughs> a dishonest administration that had to lie to you daily and misrepresent things daily. Caroline Levitt is the, uh, the youngest White House press secretary ever. My favorite White House press secretary is probably Tony Snow. The bar is set high. I think she is going to be absolutely magnificent in this gig. And it's just one of a bunch of things that get better that aren't just political stuff that I think are getting better because I'm a Republican or I'm a conservative or I have a talk show, but they're better because it's better to have a border. It's better to have a functioning economy. It's better to know how many genders there are. It's better to make America healthy again. It's better to have a strong foreign policy. And it's better to, to have honest media and speak some truth to their dishonesty because that dishonesty is not going away. All righty. Uh, 1-800-520-1234. 1-800-520-1234. I believe there are three ways you can feel. And, and listen, we're about to go to calls on all kinds of things. Trump 2.0, how's the transition going? Uh, all kinds of, of confirmations from Hegseth to Tulsi Gabbard to RFK Jr. On the Matt Gates thing, I believe there are three ways to go. One is to say this was horrible, terrible pick, Love you, Mr. Trump, but what are you doing? That's number one. The other polar opposite to that is this is great. Matt Gates is precisely what DOJ needs. He's the magical buzzsaw that's going to go in there and deliver just the right kind of accountability. And all this congressional report, that's just a bunch of noise. Ignore it. And these senators had better, uh, had better confirm him. In the middle, if you want to call it the middle, is an opinion that says, that you're going to be Gates tolerant. And that is, you know, if I'd been president, maybe I would have gone with Ken Paxton here in Texas, maybe Jonathan Turley, maybe Mike Lee in Utah, where we would have had just the same kind of positives without the, the cluster that we're going to get in a Senate confirmation. So why not do that? But that having been said, I'm not president. Trump is. And if Trump wants Gates, you got to get him, barring the discovery of some horrible thing that might now come out. So what about this House report? Should it come out? I'm going to go with yes. Secrecy is always bad. And if indeed this House report contains just a rehash of the accusations that were insufficient to have the Department of Justice do anything, then at least we'll be able to say, well, there you are. Sunlight is a disinfectant. There you go. Those charges do not rise to the level of disqualification. Now, they will to some people. Every Democrat will vote against him. Some Republicans will, too, and that leads people to think, huh, maybe this is Trump's way to find out who the uncooperative Republicans are going to be. I don't know. Can't read minds. You tell me. 1-800-520-1234. Let us head up to the fine capital city of the land of 10,000 lakes in St. Paul, Minnesota. And Tony, that is you. Mark Davis in for Hugh. How are you doing this morning? I'm good. I'm good. I'll, I'm going to talk about the appointment of Matt Gates. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually like it. Um, you were talking about Ken Paxton. He was a, he's a very good pick too, but he makes a lot of mistakes. And one of the things like? that I see is that when, well, Ken Paxton, he, when he, when he files lawsuits, a lot of them get, um, overturned or dismissed. And well, no. I don't want to see, no. go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I don't. I, I know a lot about that because I'm in Texas. So, some of these things you file, not necessarily knowing they're going to fail, but you say the right thing and you see what happens. There, there's no magical other person that could have succeeded in some of the areas where Ken's overtures did not. But anyway, but, but continue. Yeah, the floor is yours. But 
here's what I will say about Matt Gates, and people seem to forget during the peach, impeachment hearings, he was he was a very good questionnaire. He was yep. a very good he, he 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 brought common sense and made things make sense in the in his questioning of witnesses and and just the way he went about his his business. He did a very good job, and I think that that's what's needed um, in an in an attorney general. So yeah. um, I really like him. I like his attack dog style. I mm-hmm. think that he will be an attack dog. Oh, no and doubt. I think that Trump <laughs> needs an attack dog. <laughs> no because doubt. Because if he There's... doesn't have an attack, attack dog, they'll come after him again. Uh, Tony, beautifully put, and thank you. Um, there, I don't think there's any doubting Matt Gates' skill set for this gig. I think there are two things that are an impediment to people liking him. One is the, the pesky allegations, and the other is the whole Kevin McCarthy chapter. All righty, our phone number to talk about things, because there's plenty to talk about, is 1-800-520-1234. 1-800-520-1234. We are in Washington, PA. Pete, Keystone State. Mark Davis in for you. How you doing, sir? Good morning, Mark. Thank you for taking my call. Howdy. Uh, the um, I'd like to talk about the uh, uh, deportation of illegal immigrants, if I may. Yes, sir. You surely uh, may. In in my in my opinion, rounding up and deporting 20 million or whatever the number is uh, illegal immigrants will be a figurative bloodbath. And um, why? Uh, at, well, because uh, it, it, for, for starters, and foremost of which, the sanctuary cities. And in my opinion, there's an easy way of avoiding it. All right, well and um, specifically with the sanctuary cities. Mm-hmm. I would advocate that Tom Homan simply announce that, that the government will offer every illegal immigrant 250 bucks and free bus fare to the nearest mm-hmm. sanctuary city. <laughs> flood the sanctuary there's, cities. <laughs> there's something the very. Cities. Yep. There's something very Greg flood Abbott the sanctuary about. That. <laughs> uh, exactly. Look at yeah, what happened yeah. to Martha Vineyards with with 50 Absolutely. Of them. Absolutely. When well, there is something remarkable when, when the sanctuary cities, sanctuary states, find themselves flooded with the product of their policies, uh, it's amazing how eyes get opened. Pete, thank you. Appreciate it very much. Um, I think uh, uh, not a bad idea. I, th- th- was what Governor Abbott did a political theater? Was it kind of a stunt? Yes. And it was awesome. I mean, I don't say stunt derisively. I don't say political theater derisively. Uh, political theater is something you do that is designed to, to, to show, to display, to, to, to give life and breath and substance to an idea that you have, to a policy that you have. And from Martha's Vineyard to, to dropping some folks off at Kamala's house up at uh, Observatory Circle to sending them to, to Colorado and various other places, uh, New York City, all these folks looked and said, whoa. And, th- and then they went to the federal government. They went to Joe Biden's federal government and said, we need help. We need help. Well played. Exactly, exactly. But now Trump is going to be president. Tom Homan is going to be uh, at the head of uh, of the department that has to do is going to be borders are, and I, I think what we can do, I mean the term mass deportations can be misleading. We're not going to go dragging grandmas out of the house at three o'clock in the morning, no matter what Anna Navarro says on that coven at the View. Um, it, we're first going to take a look at people who are oh I don't know in jail and people who have, have committed crimes and we're going to give them the first tickets back to the country of their birth and then as we find them as we as we encounter them and no it's not going to be with random show me your papers kind of encounters in Times Square we are going to have normal law enforcement encounters involving people and if, if there's some reasonable suspicion that their their immigration status may be questionable we're going to find out the answer to that question. How about that? How refreshing is that? And if we discover that somebody's an illegal immigrant, uh, there you go. There you go. So uh, it's, it's, it's not a hard concept. It's easy to say. It's challenging to do. But we have people in power who are now going to do it, who are now going to do it. All righty, let us uh, roll to Atlanta. And Lawton, that is you. Mark Davison for you. How you doing? 
Mark Wattenheiser, how are you today? Pleasure. How are you doing? I am good. What I want to talk about, not particularly the Matt Gates uh, nomination, but when he threw the hand grenade into the Republican leadership of the House, it just threw the, 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 the governing that the Republicans could have done. It just put it back a couple of months. And I believe that governing is a process and not an event. If you look past the, the last 60 years, we've had four years of Democrat presidency, eight years of Republican, eight of, of Democrat. It's eight, four, eight, four. We need some longevity. And a bigger tent elected Donald Trump. And I think that the hard right MAGA needs to be a little more tolerant of the new people <laughs> that have come into the tent. Because that's how we're going to get longevity. And you know well, this adage, to, to turn a battleship, it's a long, slow no, turn. No, ab- absolutely really right. But, but, but guess what? But it is turning. And it's turning not from Donald Trump uh, coddling uh, centrists, but from people who may not be particularly MAGA-friendly, realizing that his policies are just better and voting for him anyway. So I think that the notion of the bigger tent is fine, but I, I think gone are the days where we need to water down and do Casper Milk Toast Republicanism, exactly the flavor that Trump is offering, precisely his boldness, attracted record numbers of people of color, uh, of, of, of people in, in swing states. He won all of them. So this notion that we now, especially now, need to kowtow to centrists, I ain't buying it. I'm not. No, no. That's not what I'm saying, Mark. The reason that the, the Democrat presidency, Biden and Harris, lost is because they went too far to the left. Mm-hmm. Too far. Mm-hmm. And people reacted and said, we don't want this craziness. We've got to get back to the middle. And I'm not talking about kowtowing to anybody. Right. I've been a MAGA supporter a long time, ever since he came on board. And um, um, I am a Trump supporter. But we can't do exactly what the Democrats did and just be well, right what, what would We're What would be an example of that? So, get, so what would be an example of the mirror image? Give me an example of something that would just be way too spicy, way too conservative, way too MAGA that would ultimately be off-putting well, and unwise. What are you thinking about? Let's go back to the Matt Gates thing. I mean, your previous caller used the description attack dog. I think the last person, the last uh, cabinet person, should be the AG be, be termed attack dog, you've got to be fair. You've got to be tough, but you've got to be fair. You just can't be taking but people and no, throwing no, them no one, off the but, boat but, because I, they're I, political. No, no, nobody's, nobody's talking about that. When, when, when the attack dog phrase or the buzzsaw or whatever, uh, nobody's talking about going in there and being as lawless as the Democrats in reverse or as uh, unhinged as they have been in their pursuit of Trump. They're talking about attacking and, and, uh, and, and, and using aggressiveness in order to restore faith, in order to restore fairness, in order to be apolitical in the Justice Department. That's, nobody's talking about, you know, uh, an equal sin committed in the other direction. I hope that's comforting. Well, there's a there's a better description than attack dog, Mark. Yeah, I, well, I listen. We're we're it's, we're pretty we're full of ourselves. It's been two weeks. <laughs> I understand well, I your point. The, I grew up in the south. I grew up in the south. And there yeah, I, I, of the yes, dog. there are. Yeah, so so may, so you're telling me pit bull is not a, a metaphor we should use either. God bless you. Thank you, man. Appreciate it very very much. All righty, we are in. Well, let's go to Vegas. Stephen, Mark Davis, in for you, Hewitt. Happy Wednesday. How you doing? Uh, I'm I'm doing fine. I Good. I hope that the Constitutional Republic can do as fine in the future. Uh, me too. Me too. I think the prospects are bright. I uh, I heard an interview uh, I don't know six or eight hours ago from a gentleman from the United Nations that's been involved in it, and what? he wrote up a. Uh, articles of impeachment. It's my understanding that's going to be presented tomorrow in the House. Stephen, 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 real, real quick. We, I need to, first of all, thank you for listening here. You need to really police where you're getting your information. The United well, Nations they, doesn't have anything. No, 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 no. This is really serious. This is really serious, Stephen. 
the United Nations has nothing to do with impeaching presidents. There is zero chance that Biden is going to be impeached with a few weeks left in his presidency. That would be I'll, stupid. I'll call you back Are you here? P- please do, and you, and we will we'll let you okay. we'll let you co-host. Okay. I, I pr- appreciate you. Love all people. Wow, I I am. I am one of those people who um, who celebrates the fact that everybody has free speech and that all kinds of platforms are out there, all kinds of places where you can get your information. By the way, I'm also a big believer in accountability. When I'm here, I, I say when you is here, when all the Salem hosts or I'm filling in for them and on the local show that I do, there's something you think just ain't quite kosher. You just uh, give us a shout and we'll talk to you about it. But dude... If, uh, if, if, if the words United Nations, impeachment, Biden, and tomorrow are in your Google searches, we have a problem. So you could say there's a lot going on in Congress here as Trump 2.0 approaches. If only we had a really talented congressional reporter we could call up right now. Why, looky here, it's Olivia Beavers at Politico. Hey, Olivia, how you doing? Busy times. Hi. Oh, it is, but it's a fun time to be a reporter on the Hill. And I even can today, only imagine we... that it is. Yeah. Go Even ahead. Today, tell me, there's, do me, just there's, real quick first. Yeah, tell me about the ethics committee. Didn't mean to step on you. Sorry. This ethics committee is going to do something yes. with the Gates report. What are they going to do? We don't know their agenda entirely, but Democrats and Republicans on the ethics panel, which is one of the few that's still evenly split, is going to meet today. Uh, and the expectation is they're going to deliberate what they think should happen with the Gates ethics report. And so they could do several different things. They could vote it out of committee and make it public. They could vote and to send it to the Senate Judiciary Committee before Gates um, Gates's nomination to be attorney general is considered. Um, but there seems to be very different perspectives, as you might imagine. Democrats want <laughs> that report out and they are saying it vocally. Of course. And then you have Republicans who are just being completely silent. I'll ask, do you want it out? And they're not answering that question. And it comes as Speaker Johnson and others have said, don't release it. We think you should stick with the more common precedent, which is to not release a report after a member has left. There is some precedent of releasing it um, in the past, but Johnson has dismissed those and said it was wrong for them to do that. So five Democrats, five Republicans. If all the Republicans say don't release it, it's a 5-5 deadlock. What happens? Then it's dead. So you need one Republican to side with Democrats Mm -hmm. in a vote. And um, the question is, who wants to raise their hand at this point (laughs) and go against the Trump administration? If you look at Chairman Guest, um, you know, and I'm not saying that he's expected to or anything, but like, just think of this example. He has had two or repeated tough primary races. So if he was someone who stuck his hand up and said, I think this should come out and it became public, then the Trump rule could come after him. And I tried to ask him, do you, are you afraid of this situation? He goes, no, I'm not afraid. We're going to do what's right. The ethics panel is going to do what it's supposed to do. Um, and so we don't really know what his answer means, but they're going to deliberate. And um, Republicans privately met on Monday in the Capitol. And for what I presume, they wouldn't answer was to talk about this report. Is there some logic where somebody could say, look, the, the DOJ decided not to go with it. It's going to be they said he said Sunlight is a good disinfectant. Secrecy never is a good look. So a Republican could say, I want it out there so that we can say we put it out there and it does not rise to the level of disqualification. Could anybody get away with that? Yes. And and, and we've had actually Republicans saying that and putting their names on it. Rick Allen of Georgia said that he goes, I think Matt Gaetz should say he wants it out there so that they can't use it against him. If there's nothing in there, then um, what's the problem? Um, and he also said transparency is good in this case. I'm sure you'd hear Matt Gates counter argue that he doesn't expect it to be fair and that the swamp is coming after him and, you know, dismiss whatever the findings are. Um, there is a chance that we already know what some of the allegations are that have already been publicly reported, but there might be just further details. The question is, if you see what those allegations are with a different testimony, with um, p- potential witnesses saying they saw different things, and um, the allegations are sexual misconduct and drug use, which Gates has denied, um, 
that might be a very different sort of thing seeing it um, versus actually just seeing news reports of, you know, background sources that people can dismiss more easily. This deserves more than the 60 seconds we have, but let's work together on it. Mike Johnson says he's going to work delicately, show dignity and respect to all people. But we have a transgender mm -hmm. congresswoman. I, 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 I see the instant conflict. Do we let a biological man into the ladies room or do we not? But how many mass use? Uh, you're on Capitol Hill all the time in your own office or in various places. Isn't there the single use restroom that's available for almost everybody, especially actual members of Congress? Or is this going to be a big fiery deal in the coming days? So actually, in members' actual offices, they do have private bathrooms, but say that they're in a different building and they're having yeah. a, a committee meeting. Those rooms are largely communal bathrooms. Um, so maybe the committees, which I wouldn't be allowed in, in the, in the you know, back spaces have private bathrooms for members. I'm not aware of those, but actually in the hallways, they are generally shared. Um, there are, I think, a few scattered around here or there that are um, individual bathroom stalls, but uh, it, it probably is not going to be a discussion that's, you know, just easily waved off by saying, oh, she has one in her, you know, in yeah, her office. Yeah. Hey, I tried. <laughs> I, I, I tried. <laughs> Olivia, thank you so much for your effort and everything you do at Politico. Appreciate it very much. The great Olivia Beavers. Speaking of people uh, who I'm filling in for and who are here on the radio network and on the Salem News Channel, we want to thank all of you so very, very much for your prayers for our colleague Dennis Prager. Uh, bad, bad fall in his home uh, about a week and a day ago, Tuesday morning of last week. Uh, back injuries, spinal injuries, that's never good. There is progress and that is good. Prayers are always good. So continue to send them in Dennis's direction as what we seem to have before us is a, a positive prospect for healing, but it seems like one of those stories that is going to take a while. So in the meantime, there'll be a lot of people filling in for Dennis. I'm proud to be one of those people. And so we're going to keep the fires burning for him and keep our prayers focused on him as we work forward. So God bless Dennis, because uh, we as a broadcast family, as a network, as a news channel, will not be whole until he returns. So thank you. All right. We are made whole today on the broadcast by a whole lot of your calls at 1-800-520-1234. And I'm about to spring right back into those. Uh, if you're just joining us, uh, hey, how's that Matt Gates thing going to work out? It's kind of a separate question to how do you think it's going to work out? I've laid out a spectrum of how you can feel about the Gates nomination. You can feel like, wow, that was terrible. He is completely unworthy. The other side of that coin is he is awesome, exactly the antidote to DOJ corruption, just the kind of uh, disruptor that we need. And in between those two, there are people who I guess I would call Gates tolerant. And by that, I mean, we understand his attributes. We understand the pluses that he would bring. But uh, here comes a confirmation hearing that's just going to be a mess. Uh, a bunch of he said, they said allegations. And couldn't you have found somebody from a Ken Paxton to a Jonathan Turley to a Mike Lee uh, who could have brought all of Gates's positives without the screaming negatives? I think that answer is obviously yes, but I do attach a, a little bit of an addendum to that, and that is that I'm not president. Trump is. He wants him. So my general inclination is to think if he wants him, he should have him, unless there's something that arises that is just so universally, and I don't just mean Democrats don't like it or people who love Kevin McCarthy don't like it, because that's, that's a lot of the bad blood. And when they came after Kevin McCarthy, I, I just said, why? Why? Uh, what, why is this? Um, I will tell you that the people who love Kevin, the people who are close to Kevin, and certainly count you among those, um, are, are, are they're, they ain't over it. Um, most of America probably is. And I think the healing factor in this was that we wound up with Speaker Mike Johnson, who is wonderful. So I, I think most folks are just thinking, okay, do we, have, do we have a good, solid speaker? Especially now, it seems that we do. So anyway, those, I guess, are the three general ways to feel about Matt Gates. Which one are you? 1-800-520-1234. I did bring up with Olivia Beavers at Politico. Um, we, we have a trans member of Congress. So, wow, who, who thought that wasn't going to come with some attached talk show topics? And, and gee, shocker, they are bathroom related. 
where does Sarah McBride go to the John? Uh, there, there's no, uh, there's no easy choice. The best choice is in a single-use restroom of the type that are everywhere. I mean, almost every restaurant that I go to now. I mean, one of my favorite restaurants has a thing that has a man, woman logo, a space alien. They said basically, we don't care what you are, just wash your hands. And it's a single-use restroom, so it truly really doesn't matter who's in there because you're not going to run into anybody in there. It's a single-use restroom. But as Olivia pointed out, outside some hearings and some, you know, and I, listen, I don't know, the members have to use the, uh, you know, the same restrooms that the rest of us do as, as we're just trolling the holes of Congress. But um, if, if, there is, if at some point a member of Congress needs to go into a big old bathroom where there's a whole lot of people, here are the choices, and neither one of them will satisfy everyone. One, we let a biological man into the ladies' room. That's a deal breaker for me, but I'm a dude. It's also a deal breaker for Nancy Mace, who has said, I don't want to be in the bathroom with a biological man. Now, I don't think that anybody thinks that, that Sarah McBride is going to attack or molest anybody. However, this is you know sort of a nose in the tent. If we do it here, the argument can be made for biological men in ladies' rooms everywhere, and that's a deal breaker for many people. And i got to tell you, it's, it's, a, it's a deal breaker for me. The other, and for Nancy Mace, and she's getting death threats from this. The other choice is 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 to make her use the make, make uh, there's the pronoun make Sarah use the men's room, which will which while it honors science and speaks to truth because Sarah McBride is a man, uh, it just seems it's the optics in America 2024 are not great. And, and listen, there are a lot of people, I'm, I'm sitting there looking at um, various uh, Twitter accounts, Matt Walsh, the always entertaining and always bold Matt Walsh, who says, listen, you can cosplay as a woman all you want, but it's just not, it's not women's problem. It's, it's that maybe what you need to do is show some respect for actual women and, and not, you know, bring your whole set of circumstances into their restroom. Uh, so so what, do, what do you want to do? Just what do you want to do? How do you solve this? 1-800-520-1234. Is there anything else? There, Of course there is. There's Tulsi Gabbard. There's there's Pete Hegseth. There's so many nominations. And, and Linda McMahon at Education. She was a Trump transition co-chair. She was small business, uh, SBA small business administration administrator during Trump's first term. Uh, she could, <laughs> you might have noticed that she and Vince uh, founded the WWE. So thanks, Linda, for, uh, for, for The Rock and Hulk Hogan. She was appointed, as, yeah, but what about education? What about education? She was appointed to the Connecticut Board of Education in 2009. Uh, she's on the board of a university. Uh, she was a former candidate to represent Connecticut in the United States Senate. So from education to government, Linda McMahon absolutely has uh, a resume that speaks to uh, a, a deserving post as Secretary of Education, maybe our last Secretary of Education. Wouldn't that be something? And, um, and I think that'd be wonderful. I don't think we need Secretaries of Education, Energy, or Commerce. Trump is offering them up, and that's great, but maybe these are things we don't need to have cabinet posts for anymore. So with that, let's hop to your calls, 1-800-520-1234. We are in East Tennessee. Ricardo, Mark Davis in for Hugh. How are you? Welcome and happy Wednesday. Hey, Mark, thanks for letting me in. Doing a great job. I love when you're in here. Thank and you. I, I told Dennis, I told Dennis when he drained the pool not to take the skateboard in there, but he doesn't listen. So you know, I'll joke on the side, get better, Dennis, for praying for you. But hey, I got two quick words before I drop, drop the Matt Gates info on you. One mm -hmm. is demolishment. Those are accomplishments that have bad results that are talked about like they're good results. So thank God we didn't have four years of demolishment. Correct. And the other one, and the other one is Warvana. Warvana is the state of bliss that people like Liz Cheney and Chuck Schumer stay in when we're involved in foreign money laundering schemes to enrich their families. I mean, foreign conflicts of interest to protect America. Yes, sir. So, good material. Warvana. Good material. Right on, baby. So let's get into Matt Gates. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I don't think this report should come out because I'm still hearing about Russian hookers from the normie norms out here. I know. What happens is, what happens is that they're going to make whatever lies are in that report, they're going to make that Matt Gates true uh, to, to their party. And no matter what you hear about Matt Gates, they're going to be like, 
Yeah, but he likes kids and puppies. Uh, and so, you know, you can't win in that situation. Just don't release it, in my opinion. I think, I think you can, except I think you can win. Listen, your point is, is thoroughly worthy. Uh, Mike Johnson himself says don't let it out because of, of a dangerous precedent, the notion of a House Ethics Committee report coming out when nobody's in, when somebody's not even in the House sure, anymore. Sure. Is that, that, that is dicey. Democracy covering things up makes us look scared of it. Is that good optics? There's, there's a big voice in my head that says let this thing out. If it's the same thing the DOJ passed on, then it deserves to be passed on. And don't we have the courage yes. to kind of say, right, and he's going to be asked all this stuff anyway. Isn't it kind of a law sure. of physics that there's no way this thing is going to remain secret? Yeah, I get that. I get that. I think I was kind of on the fence with it, but I think because of my experience with the uh, with the normie norms out here and how they just I, seem to I know. I know. reiterate the truth over and over. No, I, I, so, I hear you. Good points. All right, Ricardo, thank you. I appreciate it very much. I totally, totally get it. If this thing comes out. Oh, the Democrats' hairs are, are going to be on fire. Uh, but, oh, you know, all right, let's give good answers to the things that they bring up. How about that? Hey, you don't have to dig deep to find the dedication of the Heritage Foundation. The American people spoke loudly on November 5th. The message, we want our country back. The election was a rebuke of a corrupt and incompetent elite uprooting our way of life. So-called conservatives as guilty as their progressive counterparts. In a very important new book, Dawn's Early Light, Heritage Foundation President Dr. Kevin Roberts announces the arrival of a new conservative movement. The message is simple. Global elites, your time is up. His book charts a path for the American people to take back the country. And with a renewed sense of clarity and purpose, chapter by chapter, Dawn's Early Light identifies institutions, conservatives need to build, others we need to take back, some we need to get rid of, Ivy League colleges, New York Times, FBI, Department of Education, BlackRock. Dawn's Early Light is a blueprint for how we the people drain the swamp, take the country back, and keep it. So everybody listening, get a copy of Dawn's Early Light, Dawn's Early Light, wherever you buy books, Dawn's Early Light by Dr. Kevin Roberts. All righty, let's grab some of your calls, 1-800-520-1234, 1-800-520-1234, and we are in, hang on a second, we are in Virginia, and George, that is you. How are things in the Commonwealth? Nice to have you. Well, so far, so good, sir. It's a good Hi. program. I'm glad I tuned in this morning. Thank you. I was you. telling your phone caller that. Yeah, I heard on re uh, yesterday that there was a, a shredder truck. Now, that's a pretty good size gadget parked outside <laughs> yes. the Department of Justice. And I was telling your phone call of what I would like to see, and I'm going to bet my last breath that I won't see, is somebody come up with an uh, injunction and say, hold on, boys, wait a minute, here, don't be doing this. And to go back to a point that Ricardo made about the money, uh, I think the war in Ukraine – this is a war-sized uh, deal that goes back to Obama. Spread the wealth. Spread the wealth. Billions of dollars. Spread the wealth. I think that's what's going on. And, George, I appreciate you. you Thanks. Know. And I actually, I actually looked into the shredder truck, and here's my in-depth investigation. So as I'm sitting here looking at the calls, and there's a gentleman who says there was a shredder truck out front of, uh, of the Department of Justice. So instantly, <laughs> the, the conspiracy wheels begin to turn. But as we've learned, yesterday's conspiracy is, is often tomorrow's headline. So I took a look at this, and um, I, I, it, there's a picture of the truck out in front of the Department of Justice. And it's a big, a big, it's a big truck. And how do you know? First of all, what is a shredding truck? I wasn't really familiar. Is that just some big thing? You, <laughs> you feed stuff into the back and it turns into those little paper ribbons. I don't know. What this is, is a pretty conventional looking truck. And on the side of it is the company name. Company name is The Shredding Company. Instantly, I thought, this seems like a bit. <laughs> this is, is somebody just trying to get clicks. Look at, look at there. There's producing. There it is. The Shredding Company. Is this for real? So I looked at their logo, looked at their phone number. They are for real. The Shredding Company operates out of Mount Airy, Maryland, west of Baltimore. So now the question becomes, if you are looking to shred things at the Department of Justice, isn't there a more local company you could find? What exactly are these people doing in front of the Justice Department? And the overarching question is, is there ever, on the streets of Washington, 
a moment where you might find a shredding company truck in front of the Department of Justice? The answer is yes, you might. So the next question, it's like a flowchart. I do love flowcharts. So the next question is, is this in any way suspicious? I don't know. Is there ever the need to shred stuff at the Justice Department legitimately? I would presume there, and I presume there is, as a picture of Merrick Garland and Joe Biden hits the Salem News Channel. You guys are awesome. So uh, uh, maybe if, if James Comer's day isn't full enough, little House Oversight Committee. Hey, how about calling the company? Subpoena the company. Hello, Shredding Company, Mount Airy, Maryland. What were you guys doing at the Department of Justice? Inquiring minds want to know. All right, 1-800-520-1234. We've done a lot on the Trump incoming picks, uh, the trans member of Congress, and how do we handle the bathroom issue? How do we handle a number of issues two weeks after the election? And here comes the inauguration. <laughs> it's, it's only been two weeks. Who knows what lies ahead in terms of news stories uh, moving toward the actual inauguration on January 20th. We are in Nevada. Wilson, Mark Davison for you. How you doing? Happy Wednesday to you. Happy Wednesday, Mr. Davis. Hi. I'm uh, calling about the uh, picks for the departments and the axing departments. Thanks to uh, Team Doge, uh, our friends, uh, the, the Muskox and the Swami, we're going to be rid of uh, the Department of Education. I recommend uh, the ACT Act, where Congress goes in and axes the Departments of Agriculture, Commerce, and Transportation. Uh, I've never met a cabbie who needed uh, the transportation department, never met a miner who needed the uh, Department of, oh, okay, let's add the Departments of Energy and uh, and Interior. And uh, commerce can go. Agriculture can go. Farmers don't need a Department of Agriculture. Yeah, I think you're identifying all kinds of things that have been a magnet for federal dollars, and that's why we can never cut spending, because so many issues, so many policies involve money coming from our pockets, from the states, you know, up into the Rube Goldberg uh, device of Washington, and then issued back to us in the states so that politicians can say, look what I did for you. How about just leaving the money in the states for these things and let them uh, be controlled more locally? I like it, too. Yes. Before I, I mean, go... I'd yes. like to say God bless Dennis Prager, God bless you, Hewitt, and God bless you, sir. Listen, we, we, we all thank you individually and collectively. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate it very, very much. All right, 1-800-520-1234, 1-800-520-1234. In our closing half hour here, let me uh, get to some of the delicious audio of the week gone by. Um, Nancy Mace uh, is, is, listen, I can sit here and talk about who ought to be in men's rooms and who should not. And my answer tends to be men and, and women in women's rooms, et cetera, et cetera. And that's not without sympathy and empathy for people with gender dysphoria. Uh, I, I want, you know, the notion of like forcing this woman, this, this man who's living as a woman, you know, into the, into the men's room. I, I, I totally get that that's, that's a, a rough patch. But that, that's why my solution has always been, you know, the, the, the single use facility so that you're not in there with anybody. And I know that's not always, always, always going to be a possibility. And if anybody is saying, well, hey, you know, just why not? She's a member of Congress. Why not? This has been, uh, I think, Hakeem Jeffries and others. As a matter of fact, here, here's Hakeem and his take on it. And then Nancy Mace, who's getting death threats because of hers. This is cut 11 in a House press conference. Hakeem Jeffries on the, uh, the notion of, of trans folks in restrooms. Go. As Catherine Clark indicated, the notion that this incoming small House Republican conference majority is beginning to transition to the new Congress by bullying a member of Congress. This is what we're doing. This is the lesson that you've drawn. Bullying. Is that what we're going to call it? Is that what we're going to call women who say, I don't want a biological man in the restroom with me? And if we stipulate that, um, that Sarah McBride uh, does not particularly pose a, a, a threat, a, a palpable danger uh, to members of, uh, to women in, in the ladies' room, 
She doesn't, but the precedent is one worth noticing. Nancy Mace has. This is cut 13. Uh, Nancy Mace, who again is getting death threats for standing up for a woman's right to privacy and not running across a, a biological man uh, in the restroom. Nancy. Is this effort in response to Congresswoman McBride coming to Congress? Yes, and absolutely, and then some. I'm not going to stand for a man, uh, you know, if someone with a penis is in the women's locker room, that's not okay. And I'm a victim of abuse myself. I'm a rape survivor. I have PTSD from the abuse I've suffered at the hands of a man. And I know how vulnerable women and girls are in private spaces. So I'm absolutely 100% going to stand in the way of any man who wants to be in a women's restroom, in our locker rooms, in our changing rooms. I will be there fighting you every step of the way. Tell me what's unreasonable about that. Tell me what is unreasonable about that. It, it is, like so many things are, a collision of concerns, a collision of rights, a collision of interests. I, if, if, if Sarah McBride is, uh, has, has changed herself in certain ways and, and is living life as a woman, I'm, I'm a... a live and let live conservative. That's none of my business. It becomes my business if Sarah McBride wants to be in the ladies' room. And it's really Nancy Mace's business if Sarah McBride wants to be in the ladies' room because biologically, scientifically, in the genders invented by God and defined by science, she is, Sarah McBride, got to avoid the pronouns, is not a woman. So, you know, Listen, you help me. 1-800-520-1234. We are in California. And Kyle, that is you. Welcome to the Hugh Hewitt Show. Mark Davis sitting in. Happy Wednesday. Good morning, Mark. Hi. Yeah, hey, I think the, uh, the whole deal here is nobody's calling a spade a spade. This is a mental disorder that is being uh, poured out upon the American citizens. They are trying to make us believe that this is a normal way of thinking. Same thing with the sanctuary cities. How come we are allowing uh, this this thought that is obviously uh, a mental disorder to encapsulate Americans to think make normal people feel guilty uh, for telling a man to, uh, that it's not okay to use the restroom? You know, I really strongly believe that it's a, a mental disability that they are trying to cast upon the American people. Uh, and get us all to believe that it's it's a normal way of, of living. We've uh, allowed uh, un mentally unstable people into Congress, mentally unstable people <laughs> to cause yeah. sanctuary cities, and now yeah. the rest of the normal citizens have to deal with it. It is it, absolutely it, it, absurd. Interesting linkage of those two, and thank you. I appreciate it. Normalcy is an interesting word. What is What is normal? It is normal to have a border, so now we're going to have a better one. There are gender definitional norms. The Bible itself says we are created male and female. Science defines us as such. You can be a stone-cold atheist and know what the definition of male and female are. And yet, uh, there is such a thing as gender dysphoria. It is a mental dysfunction. And the interesting thing, I mean, so what do we do? I don't just want to stop there and go, hey, it's a mental illness, so screw them. Not, not at all. I, I, th that's got to be a very, very tough row to hoe to, to feel like you are trapped in the wrong body as the narrative so often goes. But the question is, I mean, and as a live and let live person, I'm not gonna chase somebody down or be mean to them or berate them or be unkind to them if that's, the, the, their, if that's their journey. But am I going to say that it's okay for biological men to be in a restroom with my daughter or with my wife or with Nancy Mays? And is she gonna say that it's okay? Don't they have rights, too? Don't they have rights as well? And here I am for another segment here to wrap it all up. Mark Davis in for Hugh. Uh, the great Ed Morrissey of Hot Air fame will be here tomorrow. Dwayne Patterson will wrap up as he will wrap up the week Friday, just as he started the week on Monday. And Hugh is back next week. So there we all, we're all here for you. Just working our way through a day of issues. So let's see who's uh, who's on the phone here in our last couple of minutes. 1-800-520-1234. We are in Pittsburgh. Hi, Jane. Mark Davison for Hugh. Welcome. Happy Wednesday. How are you? I'm fine. How are you, Mark? Good. Thank you. 
uh, I just wanted to comment on the restroom situation. Mm-hmm. I think we should make ladies' restrooms for biological women and make men's restrooms unisex. Then there's Whoa. no arch- architectural changes involved. Oh, so okay, gotcha. So interesting. So the, that would that would mean that women were no longer presented with biological males, right. but uh, but but men might be presented with biological women who are who are, who are looking to be the the Chaz Bono uh, model, if we will. Or just because it's convenient, whatever. Well, yeah, but convenience isn't maybe necessarily always the guiding uh, the, the guiding force. And so, where would Sarah McBride go? I mean, would you know, where would, because um, we're not going to let her, so where, where would Sarah McBride, a trans woman, go? She'd have to go to the unisex restroom. Well, okay, because gotcha. That's, that's sort of the, the, the definition. But, but the, okay, well, you know, there, there's a way in which this works, and thank you. And I've, uh, I guess it's just restaurants or clubs or something. The, there's such a thing as the unisex bathroom, but it tends to be you go in there and there's like, and I guess this is what she means, like 10 stalls. Everybody has a stall. It's like 10 individual restrooms, so you're not, you know, coming face-to-face or whatever to whatever uh, with, with somebody who's gender dysphoric. You know, maybe so. Maybe so. I, re- I, w- I want to play ball with, with a solution that, 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 that honors the definition of gender, that, that respects Nancy Mace's right and any woman's right, not to be confronted with a biological man in close quarters uh, in a restroom or especially a locker room. And here's the thing. How you get, you know, I, there's no such thing as a unisex locker room. You know, everybody's out there with everything just out there, and there you go. So th- that's, at some point, this is something that has to have a solution. There's no solution that's easy, but I'm always going to opt for the solution that honors the definition, the definition of gender uh, invented by God and... Um, and defined by science. I, I think that's just a, a good good place to settle it. We are in San Antonio. Jack, Mark Davis, how you doing? In for Hugh Hewitt. Welcome. Happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday to you, sir. How you uh, doing? Hi. Uh, you know, I'm wondering, uh, maybe Republicans need to ask these Democrat governors, are you planning to do what Democrats did 150 years ago against another popular Republican president? Uh <laughs> Start a new confederacy instead of exploiting slaves, they'll be exploiting illegal aliens, not for their labor, but for their votes. Yeah, exploitation is the key word of late. And I think a lot the reason a lot of Hispanics drifted over in the Republican direction, same reason a lot of black folks drifted over in the Republican direction, is they felt that the Democrat Party took them for granted. I don't know if they necessarily felt full on exploited, but they certainly uh, felt taken for granted. All right, final burst of uh, of audio or video, as the case may be. Uh, Captain Kirk on with William with with, uh, with Bill Maher. Bill Sh- uh, William Shatner is a force of nature. Is he ninety three? Is he ninety four yet? It's amazing. I've been a fan forever and ever and ever. And here's a little stretch of him on Bill Maher that that got Admiral Kirk in some trouble. Take a look. I can't. I don't know why why the Democrats lost. I don't. I don't understand why. The Democrats lost eye. Well, people will be writing books about it for years, many reasons. Part of it was, you know, uh, just he, Biden should not have stayed on so long. That I understand. But uh, inflation, uh, prices have come down, um, uh, the economy is good. To, I mean, I don't know why they voted against her, Well, uh, against I mean, the party. As Oh, well, I certainly could go on and on about that. Um, but basically, you know, people, she was not a great candidate, let's be honest. Um, when she said, when they well, asked... Why isn't she a great candidate? She combined several trends of thought here. Black, uh, woman... Uh, that's not. That's not a candidate. Those are... You know, that's identity politics. That's well, one of the Democrats. Problems. Those are elements. Yes, those are elements that don't matter a lick. And the economy getting a smidge better for the last 10 minutes doesn't mean that the last four years have been great. I actually tweeted a reply to William Shatner. I said, Bill, you're great. Don't worry about it. You're get, catching all kinds of heat. People didn't want to buy what she was selling, and she was a terrible candidate. Sometimes that happens.